you everybody for being so patient. Uh, so, I guess now we can begin formal. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Trustees, my colleagues in faculty and administration, media and press, students, and of course Mr. Nafiz bin Zafar and his family, of course. A very warm welcome to you all. That The Department of Computer Science and Engineering, Independent University, Bangladesh, is happy and proud to be able to organize this event. In this media critical country of ours, it is indeed an honor to have somebody amongst us who is the epitome of excellence. Nafis doesn't need any introduction. Still, uh, I'd like to read out a very short bio of Nafis bin Zafar. Nafis bin Zafar is a principal engineer at DreamWorks Animation. He has worked on a long list of blockbuster films over the last 13 years, such as Pirates of, Pirates of Caribbean, Kung Fu Panda, the Transformers you know, franchises. Nafis won an Academy Award in 2008 for his work on pioneering digital fluid effects now used throughout the visual effects industry. His expertise ranges across distributed computing, image processing, and dynamic simulation systems. He is an active contribu contributor to leading academic conferences and serves on the AMPAS, I believe it stands for Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, AMPAS committee that confers academy awards for technical contributions to the film industry. And now, uh, uh, some uh, juggling I'll be constantly doing between PowerPoint and playing some movies. Uh, part of being in the movie industry is uh, working under pressure and working under circumstances that you're not really prepared for. And today uh, I forgot to bring a, uh, a video adapter and so uh, you will suffer for that a little bit, I'm afraid. Uh, so <laughs> we're at a university and I'm going to teach a class. It's going to be called Animation 101 and it's going to be about movies. Uh, so, to, to get it started, I just want to give you an overview of what it is to make a movie. What are all the different stages? And it starts with, as you can imagine, story, and, and then we go through lots of technical and artistic stages, and, and eventually, at the end, we've got a whole movie that needs to get edited down and, and shipped out onto to drives and, and shown on theaters across the world on a synchronized date. Um, it's, it's a massive artistic challenge, and it's a mega engineering project. Uh, and I can't stress enough at how um, making movies is all about bringing together uh, the most artistic of skills with a uh, tremendous amount of, of ingenuity. Uh, so that very first stage, though, starts with a story. It's, it's, very, uh, it's very much an artistic process where uh, a few people will sit down and they'll come up with some, some very simple concepts and, and they'll talk about it. They'll get up in front of a board. Uh, there's, there's no computers, as you can see in that, in that screen we've got. It's, it's a guy sitting, very much like me, sitting, uh, standing in front of a, a board and, and he's, he's just showing off some drawings that he did. And he's talking about this, this process of, of telling a story. Right? And, and once you have a good story, people will, will want to watch your movie, and that's really the goal. Um, so part of that storyboarding is, is not simply just coming up with a story, but there are lots of drawings. And um, this is, uh, strangely enough, something that's common across both live action, where we actually take a camera and film actors, as well as, as in feature animation, um, where you know, what you see is what you call as cartoons. Right? Uh, it starts with a very similar process of story. In this case, um, you know, the, the movie that, that all these, uh, this, this animation 101 is based on is, is a movie called How to Train Your Dragon. It was released in 2010, and it was, uh, it was quite a blockbuster hit for, for my studio, DreamWorks Animation. Um, so, but at the beginning of that movie, what it looks like are these sketches that you see on, on your left. They're, they're sometimes drawn on a computer, and sometimes they're pencil sketches drawn on napkins. And, uh, on the right, you see the final frames that those sketches turned into. Um, so once we've got a good story, and we'll start talking about, well, how will this movie actually look? Right? Well, this How to Train Your Dragon movie was about Vikings fighting with dragons. 
And so we've got lots of Vikings. And uh, this particular frame that we're looking at isn't something that's made for the movie. It's supposed to get, give you the feel of these fierce Vikings. They've got red beards and swords and shields, and they're menacing, and they're going to attack you, and they're going to kill you. Um, they are scared. And this is how they look. This, this, these kinds of drawings gives us a feel for, for how they will look. Uh, we've also got dragons, of course, which are equally fierce, and they breathe fire, and they spit molten lava, and, and, and have all kinds of interesting and scary traits to them. Um, and this is how these, and there are many different kinds of them. It's not just one kind of dragon. Some, uh, some are small, some are big, and so on. Uh, so this is visual development. Uh, part of visual development isn't just about characters, but about how the world is actually going to look behind it. Uh, you may notice from this picture, this, this is the island of Burke, and Burke is where the Vikings live. And you can see that there are lots of pointed structures. There's, there's spy, ice spires that are poking out, there are rock spires that are jutting up. Um, and that, that again sets a tone for the movie, the tone for the story that, that we're really trying to tell. Um, and of course, we do have some main characters that we have to worry about in, in this case. It's a, it's a story about uh, an erstwhile her hero named Hiccup and a, and a dragon. Uh, so here they are, and uh, here's their interaction, also store, uh, told as, as a visual development uh, point. Um, obviously, you can tell not much of this is computer generated. This is really just a person sitting down and, and <laughs> doing some pencil tests and taking some crayons and coloring in those tests. Um, eventually, though, we do start to, to get into uh, on, in, onto the box, as we call it box as a computer, uh, uh, and, and that's just our jargon. <laughs> so we start to, to build out these characters, and we do start to do more careful studies. The, these dragons, as I said, have different kinds of traits, and some crawl, and some fly, and, and our characters, of course, have different kinds of looks. Um, one of the interesting parts for me is that you know this is a very dynamic process. It isn't like the story is written, and then it's locked. Uh, for example, uh, this is uh, one of the main characters, Astrid, and when we were starting out the movie, Astrid was a very sweet, cute girl. You know, she was funny, she was bubbly, uh, but as we went through this process of making this movie, in the end, she ends up being like this really tough and, and strong and fierce leader of Vikings. And you can see that in, in that picture on the left, which is how she looked at the very beginning of the process, and then how she looked at the end as... as uh, you know, the fierce warrior she, she really was in the movie. Um, we also get to start to find out some technical challenges that these characters will entail. Uh, for example, um, this guy, the, the peg leg guy, I, I can't remember his name, like Fish Hooks or something. But, um, well, he's, he's got this long beard that's going to bounce around and touch lots of things. And that's kind of a technical challenge, and it's nice to find out at this stage what these challenges will be. Um, we start getting more and more into this process that's called modeling and surfacing. This is where we actually start to create computer-generated models. But these characters, as you can see, and, and the models, um, it, a computer-generated model is really, it's a mathematical representation, right? It's, it, that's a very boring way to put it, but it's also very elegant. Um, we use things like um, NERVs, which stands for Non-Uniform Rational B-Splines. Um, you, you will see them in linear algebra textbooks. Um, they, look, they can look very dry, but of course, in the hands of an artist, they can start to look very interesting. And these are these very simple core mathematical ideas that we leverage uh, to generate uh, computer, uh, computer models. Um, of course, it's not just characters, and it's, it's a lot about having these uh, the environments, right? We've got Vikings have boats, and there are all these rocks, and they're things that go into their living quarters, and uh, it's incredibly detailed, like we model things down to like the bolts, because you won't really know where the camera will be, you're creating this virtual world, and, and the virtual cinematography can involve going anywhere in that world, so we just build everything out to maximal detail. Um, on a character, um, if we were modeling humans, sometimes we'll go in and we'll model the living hours. <laughs> It's, it's 2,000 people, we're, we're a full studio, so we aren't just artists. 
there are lawyers and there are toy designers and there are marketing people. We even have our own chefs um, because we all work together on these uh, these on, on making these movies. Um, so my start in the movies, though, began about 13 years ago uh, when I went to work for a company called Digital Domain. And Digital Domain is a live action studio, so now I do feature animation. Most of the stuff you saw was feature animation. Um, but back in the day, I used to do live action. Um, and you know, that, that involved you know, many things. Um, live action is... Uh, <laughs> live action, when I started, uh, was very much done in camera, meaning that if you wanted to create something, you created a model and you filmed it. And we tried to add a little bit of CG to it, um, but ultimately, you know, there wasn't a great deal of success. Um, one of these things that I worked on was digital fluid effects. And, and why that's interesting is that digital fluid effects in general used to be very expensive. Um, because you have to design these models, right? And you've got to make a big dump tank. And it turns out water at a small scale doesn't look the same as water at a big scale, so you have to add like special kind of materials to lower the coefficient of viscosity. And, and then you've got you know, hundreds of gallons of water that you suddenly release onto a model city. That water has to go somewhere. Like the public works department doesn't want all that chemically treated water in their sewage. Um, so you've got to deal with that. Again, I hope you're getting the, the idea that it's a huge uh, engineering nightmare, uh, which it is. Um, but uh, we had a real good motivation to say, you know, we should, we should really try to get away from doing real, real water and get into doing fake water. Um, and so we were working on this movie back in 2003 called Peter Pan. And this was the very first fluid effect that I worked on, this, this big menacing alligator, it jumps into what looks like a big tub of paint. And um, you know, when after you do some image processing tricks and you add some, some texture to it, this ended up being the final shot. And um, this, this took a lot of effort. Um, and, and this was quite unique because you know, you've got a fake alligator, it turns out, Turns out you can actually train alligators, or there are people who do it. They have lots of scars on their arms, but uh, they will do it. Uh, but it's kind of dangerous, and as you can imagine, kind of expensive. And you certainly wouldn't want children on set, which Peter Pan, if you've seen it, involves children. Um, so we can do it fake, and suddenly my company had this newfound ability, and we were able to get lots of work doing fluid effects. Um, so. You know, a few years later, we worked on this movie called uh, Pirates of the Caribbean 3. Uh, the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie was, um, was wonderful. It's one of my favorite movies, right? And um, you know, it was quite, it was, it was a great honor for me to be able to work on that, that third one. Uh, so let's see, we'll uh, play it. Sorry, you only got to see like two frames of Orlando Bloom, uh, but this is about me and my work. <laughs> the big effect in this movie was this end of the world waterfall, right? It's this massive thing, and if you've ever seen a waterfall, waterfalls are, um, are, are menacing from really far away. Once you get up close, you realize that Bernoulli's law is, is taking effect, and that edge of the waterfall to the bottom of the river is really quite shallow, but uh, we had to create this incredible, like, you know, tremendous waterfall. Um, and this boat was going <coughs> to teeter on the edge and somehow try to fight back. Um, computationally, that's, that's a real challenge because in reality, boats don't suddenly stop at the edge of a waterfall and start going the other way. Like, that's, um, that's physically impossible. So what happens, as you can imagine, if you put, 
if you put an object at the edge of a waterfall and you start pushing it the other way, all the pot water starts piling up on one side. And the director was like, I don't want to see that. I don't want this water to behave realistically. I want the water to like magically flow all around it. So we had to write all this kind of special software just to deal with like these directorial notes. And that's, you know, that sometimes sounds silly and sometimes sounds like a fool's errand. But that's the fun part because that's when you start to take um, these physical intuitions and these physical uh, abilities and you say, all right, you know what, I'm going to add my own universe to this. And that's very empowering and that's very fun. You, you, get to, you get to create this world that sort of obeys the same laws of physics, but you get to change some of them. Uh, for example, like in this particular one, I remember different parts of that ocean have different gravity. You can't really do that in the real world, but we can, and that's why we do things virtually, right? There's always this talk about like the charm of a real movie well, reality sometimes doesn't look very interesting, so we want to change it, which is why we do things this way. Um, all right, so let's get back to me talking. Um, oh, we've gone through it. Uh, we saw that. Oh, and so when I did all of this stuff, and this has been about six years of work, I got an academic award, as, you, as you've heard, and, and here, here's me getting it with, with two of my cohorts. Doug Robel and Ryo Sakaguchi, and we've been working together, and we still work together um, on a lot of stuff, and we, it was wonderful. Um, not, not only because we got an award, because, you know, there's Jessica Alba, she's applauding me. <laughs> so there are perks to the job. Um, that's water, and I've spent enough time talking about water, and I'm going to stop talking about water. That's stuff I did a long time ago, and it's cool, and I got an award for it. I want to talk about new things, uh, which is stuff that I'm more interested in working on right now, which is digital mayhem. And of course, having a big flood is part of mayhem, but um, what I wanted to get into is like how things break apart, like solid objects, when you hit like when a massive robot like smashes into a building and that building crumbles, like how do we do that? <clears throat> so to talk about that, first we've got to talk about this movie called 2012, which confusingly enough we started working on in, in 2008. Um, but anyways, I'll let uh, this movie uh, was this big budget blockbuster thing, and it had this one line in it, and then California sinks into the ocean. And that was it. That was the end of the dialogue, and it would then move on to the next scene. But the director was like, I want that sentence to be the most amazing thing ever. And he was like, there's not really going to be a whole lot of dialogue in there. It's just going to be some people screaming. But make it, like, five minutes long and all CG and destroy Los Angeles. <laughs> um, we were up to the challenge because we were like, yes, yes, that is exactly what we would also like to do. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, remember we talked about storyboards earlier, which is somebody doing some, some concepts on, the, on that, that one line and then California sticks with the ocean. Well, these are the, some of the boards we got. Uh, here's this little plane and somehow there's a fissure that's opened up in the middle of Los Angeles. And the plane flies through and we end up in downtown Los Angeles where there are lots of skyscrapers and the plane somehow like flies between the skyscrapers. And if you're trying to escape all of this, I don't know why you want to fly into skyscrapers, but that aside, here we are, we had to do this. Um, and this is materials galore, right? We've got earth, we've got concrete, we've got like rebar, we've got glass and steel, and this was like money. Um, <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, at this point you may be saying, well, there have been, there's been mayhem done for a long time, and again, it wasn't done digitally, and yet you saw it, and perhaps it looks something like this, um, and this is a scene from the movie Dante's Peak, which, was, which came out in 1998, um, really a fun movie, and, and there was this volcano that went off, and it destroyed the city, and here we see a lot of it. And what this is done with are models. They built like one-sixth scale models, and this is one of the most expensive visual effects shots 
um, in history because they built these models. And, and this isn't the full shot. There's a flood at the end. Of course, there's always a flood at the end. Um, <laughs> and this is one of the most expensive things because they, they built these models and they built the city and they had this massive dump tank and they released it. And at the end, they realized that half the cameras didn't fire. <laughs> so they had to rebuild it. Like, it was just literally already expensive, and then it became twice as expensive. Um, our producers were really interested in not having these kinds of issues. So, <laughs> we, they were like, yes, you're going to do this digitally, please, because we can't afford uh, something that problematic. Um, <laughs> okay, let's see here. Um, I'm looking for a, let's see, uh, ah, here we go. So, um, turned out that if you saw Pirates 3, there was a fair amount of destruction there too. And, and this is a great uh, example of um, the kinds of destructions. Again, some of this is digital. Clearly, you can see that blue, the blue screen panning in the background. Uh, some of this is obviously um, practical. Um, and... Therein lies this problem. When you have to destroy stuff, it's you have to build a model again, and you have to use explosives. And explosives are really dangerous. Like there's just no way around it. People lose fingers, arms, legs, their lives doing this stuff. And a movie is a really terrible reason to lose your life. And I worked on movies where a stunt person lost their life. And you know, like it, it kind of seems uh, a little amusing now that I talked about it, but it was one of those things that affected me deeply where I was like, wait, I could have done something and that guy would have still been alive. Um, and, you know, that's, that, that kind of thing is really quite motivating at the, in, at the end of the day. So, still, this is a movie that came out in 2007, and it's still mostly practical for destruction effects, right? We're adding a little bit of sweetener here and there, but not really. Um, what we wanted to get into doing is doing this virtually, and so how do we do that? Um, well, yeah, let me first show you how that movie ended up looking at the end. Um, So, you know, I showed you that score of storyboards and I told you that story about California sinking into the ocean. This is what California sinking into the ocean looks like. Right? You, you, get, um, you get some stunned looks from these well-paid actors and you get an airport falling apart behind them. Um, incidentally, that is right near where we worked. And at the, on the first day of the movie, we went to the restaurant at that airport and we were like, okay, well, we've got to destroy this place. <laughs> and so they're flying through LA, which, and, and LA has lots of freeways, which I don't know, many people know about, and it's kind of a source of humor in the US that LA's freeways are always there. Um, and LA has lots of palm trees, and those are things we have to have, and they're, they're flying really low. Um, if you've ever been to LA, this is Wilshire Boulevard. It's a real street. Uh, it's all CG. Um, <laughs> those are real City of LA buses. Um, many, many people don't know that Los Angeles does have a subway system, um, which it does. <laughs> and it fell into like an oil refinery that suddenly showed up. <laughs> so here we are, downtown LA, and they're going to duck right between these two buildings and just make it. There was some doubt, but they did make it. Um, all of those people that you saw falling from those buildings, totally virtual, no one got hurt. Uh, <laughs> and we get to clobber, clobber LA. Um, traffic in LA, never that good. Uh, and, and of course, we get to the sinking where the ocean rushes in. Um, and in that shot, in the lower left corner, you can actually see my apartment. <laughs> there is something cathartic about getting to destroy the, your, the place of your work and your home. Um, <laughs> so uh, we got to do it. Um, and, and how did we get there? 
Well, simulation. Um, and for those of you in the engineering side of things, you guys know what simulation is probably. Um, but for everyone else, what's simulation? It's applying the laws of physics to virtual objects. Uh, it's our virtual world, and what we want to do is apply F equals MA to them. And this is, you know, one of the most important relationships, uh, mathematical relationships in, you know, in, in known. And um, it's 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 my favorite equation. Um, Navier-Stokes equations are just a fancy way of writing F equals MA. The rigid body stuff falls into the same thing. Uh, Professor Newton, you know, changed the whole world by uh, coming up with this stuff, and uh, I happen to uh, make a decent living from it. Um, so we saw Dante's Peak, we saw Pirates Three, um, and you know, whenever we start to simulate stuff, and if you're in computer science, you're always taught this, which is start simple, um, right? And so what we did was uh, we we're like, well, we we basically know the the Newton's you know, laws of motion, um, and uh, we can start dropping stuff. Um, and we took boxes. Boxes are really simple. The math of boxes are super simple. And we're like, okay, well, let's just make stuff drop. Um, that doesn't really look like a building, but, you know, in the back of our minds, like, um, my friend Rio and Michael, um, these, these are a couple of guys that I worked with for a long time, and we work well, really, really well together. So we were like, you know what, I think this is going to work. We're going to use rigid body dynamics. So what rigid body dynamics is like saying, it's a solid object, but it doesn't deform in any way. So it doesn't compress, it can't be stretched, it doesn't bend, it stays the same shape. Um, and it's a numerical simplification, but it has a lot of computational advantages. Um, details uh, are not necessary, but um, uh, no, that's that's what we're talking about, rigid body dynamics. So we, get, we had some few a few boxes, and we're like, well, okay, let's add a few more boxes. Um, and well, we were like, okay, well, that, that starts to give us some nice uh, timing, right? Timing is, is what makes things funny or scary. We're like, okay, uh, we, we've got this boxes thing down. Let's try it on uh, something else. <laughs> and we started trying it on, um, let's, we were like, let's try to build a house. Let's see if um, let's see if these house slides work. Um, so, what's a house composed of? Well, a house has like framing and it has walls. Um, it has like a roof and windows and so on. Um, and uh, so, let's see. Now that we've gotten that far. So we started building these things up. So instead of using like box shapes, we're like, let's start, start with some more interesting shapes, and, and we can make stuff fall apart. Like building demolition videos on YouTube, like that's not how buildings get demolished. They kind of pancake from the bottom, right? Um, because that's where the maximal load is. Well, the doc director didn't want that, so we gave him exactly what he wanted. Um, because in our universe, it breaks, of course, it shatters into lots of little pieces. It doesn't fall in panes. Um, and, and those little yellow sh um, spikes that you saw, those were like detections of where glass would break. There are lots of little pieces that are uh, flying apart from it. Um, And, of course, dust that gets kicked around, it isn't just going to fall. There's airflow going around this building, and so it has to float in that air. Um, again, all of these things that are really subtle and you hardly see it, but if you don't see it, it looks bad. Um, all right, let's see. Um, let me show you a few. That, uh, 
So once you start adding all of those layers together, and this, none of this is actually lit, this is just the, the basic elements moving around. Um, that's how it looks like. And so for us to do this, it's really the same simulation placed over and over and over. It's just that when you're from the point of view of the actual camera, you'll never notice the fact that we've, we've done a repeat and, and we've done like a switcheroo trick um, just to save ourselves a whole bunch of time and money. Um, um, so, like I was saying, you know, we'll take that basic bottom, you know, 100 meter by 100 meter space, and then we'll just change out the tops, um, and so on. Yeah. I showed you all of these. Um, so now I, I, I want to show you. Uh, you know, this was all from 2012, um, but there's a whole bunch of other um, cool movies where this technology got used. Um, one of those being Tron, and the reason I bring up Tron is that it's uh, the original Tron, the one from 1982, is is a landmark feature film. In, and personally for me, because that was the first time I realized that things you saw in movies weren't necessarily real, and you could do more, and um, that's that's kind of cool. Like as a, as a child, for me to realize that, and kind of I always remembered it. So when I got to, got a chance to work on this movie, it was like super. Um, um, it was super gratifying, and you know these characters. Have you and thank you, Barico. I have. You yeah. have actually done that coding for that, and uh, coming from being a VFX supervisor, I have one of my team members here from Sketch Studio, mm -hmm. Mr. Ru. We have actually worked using these mm -hmm. tools and uh, everyone I'd like to give you from Sketch Studio another round of applause oh, for you. bringing these algorithms, these numerical calculations and making our life a little bit easier. Here's the catch. The catch is that how do we try to make this a little more simpler or the, does the technology still require a lot of render farms because over here, the tech in Bangladesh <laughs> is very, very limited. That's, that's right. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I'll, I'll say I, I can speak Bengali just fine. So, if you if you're feeling reluctant to ask in English, feel free to ask me in Bengali. Um, but to answer your question, um, no. Well, to you know, you can do it. Um, computers are the great equalizer of the world. The first world's computers aren't any better than the third world's computers, right? Um, but similarly, the first world's computers are no worse than the third world's computers. They cost all the same, right? Um, so there is definitely in the U.S. and I would say probably broadly in the West, um, there's certainly a viewpoint that relying more on computation-heavy processes is a market advantage because that means human resources are out of the equation, so the costs are all the same now, so you might as well continue to do it um, in, in the West where the infrastructure issues are, are, are less. That's not accidental, that's by design. After using actually uh, 32 gigs of RAM on one server, on one system, and also using another 30 gigs of RAM on another server, totally maxed out, Xeon processes and all that, we still are facing problems in simulations. Rigid body simulations, soft body simulations, liquid simulations, for example, in Bangladesh we use a lot of real flow. Mm -hmm. And over here, the liquid dynamics, it takes a lot of time for That's right. just the simulation part, just the yeah. simulating. Mm -hmm. I'm not even go, going to go into the rendering sequences. Yeah. So, um, is there any other easier way that we can actually you know, yeah. the answer is probably in this room. There's probably somebody in here who's really interested in these problems, and they can act, they can come up with a better solution than what we have now. It's the way you solve it, because when yeah. the Spacium one, still, the Hollywood is the Sure, you know, the inventiveness is, is really the thing that you need, and there are great students here, right? Like, I... I, I grew up in, in Dhaka for, for a good chunk of my life, and, and, and you have as well. And So, uh, computing, again, is very accessible for everybody, right? You, you can start on a single computer. You don't need a supercomputer anymore. And you just need a, a decent computer to do all of these things. Again, the things that, like, for example, Drop that I showed you was really before the advent of multi-core computing. 
right? Now you have much better computers than the stuff I showed from, from 2012 just here at home. Um, so it's way more accessible and, and it's something that everybody should explore and learn because it's, it's part of the new tool set and it's part of the new medium and you can have your problem solved. There are many other infrastructure problems, planning problems, resource management problems. Um, and we can apply computing to, to try and solve all of these kinds of problems. And, and I hope there are lots of people here inspired uh, to try similar approaches. Okay, if it's not broad, then what else can we use? <laughs> like I said, these are, you know, these are, these are things that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, you know, you, you would have to come up with that. May I ask everybody, to, everybody who wants to ask a question to please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to reach you, then ask questions, all right? And please let everybody else to ask questions. Don't monopolize this uh, session, okay? So please raise your hand if you'd like to ask questions. Do you have any like future plans about into the game industries like gaming animations, like something like that? Uh, me personally, no. isn't going to like this answer, but I was not going to class. I was spending a lot of time. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I wasn't wasting time. I was in, in school, right? I was, I was stuck in the computer labs, and I was like writing my own software that had nothing to do with homework. I was notorious for missing assignments. Uh, but I was, I was basically playing around with Computer graphics. When did you start your career? Um, you know, career planning wise, it probably started right in 1998 when I graduated from college. But uh, um, you know, it took me a couple of years to get into the industry and you know, I sort of position myself to be hired. Um, uh, which software should we uh, use for uh, beginners, which is user friendly, for just getting started? Um, for uh, artistic uh, type stuff or for um, the actual uh, I mean, uh, actual programming. Actual programming. Oh well, programming. Um, you know, there's 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 lots of things to explore. Like if you want to explore like visual computing type programming, there's a great programming language called Processing, which is um, which is really cool for making like lots of animations that are entirely procedural and. And there's a great community of people like who do like live motion capture and processing and image processing, and, and it's really neat. Uh, I do a lot of processing, but um, that's that's a great way to you know. I would I would recommend things that let you explore your creativity instead of something where you learn to push certain buttons. Um, so, especially again with computer graphics, start drawing sketches on paper, and then try to generate. Of that imagery in a programmatic way. And you know, I have to note that out of this entire hall, she was the first woman to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> Sir, I have there should one be more, question. right? Sir, I have one more question. Can you please suggest uh, one or two software that we should use for this? I mean, for graphics designing or animations. Oh, um, you know, um, it, it really uh, it, it depends. Like uh, he mentioned Houdini. I think Houdini is great. Uh, if you just want to paint, Photoshop's great. If you want to animate, um, then there are things like like Maya, um, all of which is, is fairly accessible. A big round of applause for.